Dr. John Duncan and Kaylee uh, Kangro. So um, their presentation is going to be on a palliative approach in renal care. And I must say, from my experience working uh, in palliative care in BC over the last number of years, I must say that the renal clinicians have really been leaders in terms of integration of the palliative approach. And um, not only John and Kaylee, but a number of renal clinicians across the province. And I also wanted to say that I had the opportunity to hear Dr. Duncan and Kaylee speak at the VGH um, kind of working education day, I guess they called it, on October the 5th, on integrating a palliative approach in renal care. And it was a fabulous presentation. So I know that we are in store for a really good presentation today. Um, just a brief word about Kaylee and John. Uh, Kaylee is a social worker at the renal program at Vancouver General Hospital. She works in both the VGH kidney clinic and the hemodialysis unit. Uh, she's involved with the advanced care planning initiative in the renal program and is also on the BC Renal Agency Conservative Management Pathway Working Group. Dr. Duncan is a nephrologist who also works at VGH and um, in fact is leading the um, Vancouver General Hospital Division of Nephrology End of Life Committee or he's on the Provincial uh, Renal Association End of Life Committee and is leading the Vancouver General Hospital Division of Nephrology initiatives around end of life issues. So he's working with the chronic kidney disease clinic bringing advanced care planning to that group and also symptom assessment and management as well as working on the conservative care pathway for patients in the chronic kidney disease clinic. So having said that and on those introductions, um, I'm pleased to hand the presentation over to Dr. Duncan and Kaylee. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, so we're, we're very grateful for the opportunity to present today and uh, uh, look forward to any kind of feedback that we may get. But we'd like to outline uh, what we're doing here at VGH, uh, what we've been up to, what we're doing now, and what we're planning to do with respect to a palliative approach in renal care. Um, so we'll start with a rough outline. Really, we're going to give you a bit of a rationale why we think the palliative approach is so relevant for our patients in particular, and certainly it's relevant for many others. Uh, we'll outline again what we've done to date and where we're at and how we got here, as well as what we're using uh, as far as resources and where we're heading in the in a, in a next 40 minutes or so. Um, first off, why are we talking about a palliative approach for our renal patients or our kidney failure patients? And to give you a bit of a picture, we'll outline our patient population. Um, the, at Vancouver General Hospital alone, and this is uh, these are numbers uh, and ratios that are echoed across uh, you know, centers across BC and across uh, Canada, frankly, we have 200 patients who have do hemodialysis in our in-center unit. So here at Vancouver General Hospital, about 200 patients who get dialysis uh, three times a week, four hours a time in this in-center unit. But we manage about 500 patients who get some form of dialysis. Others are managed in community units, so smaller units that are closer to their homes and their communities in the Lower Mainland and beyond. And uh, some of them are on home dialysis whether it's home hemodialysis or home peritoneal dialysis, uh, and all total about 500 on dialysis. For patients with chronic kidney disease not yet on dialysis or not appropriate for or choosing dialysis, we have about 1,000 patients like that that we follow in our kidney clinic. And about half of those patients, 500 or more, have quite advanced kidney failure, kidney function about 20% or lower. And those are, that's a key number because that's a, a number which we generally start making certain we're addressing the potential for further dis deterioration, the potential for dialysis or the appropriateness of dialysis and transplantation for these patients. And about a third of those patients are either appropriate for or may choose conservative care, which is essentially the full care we provide everyone short of, of replacement therapy, dialysis, transplantation. And much of our efforts now and going forward are going to be on those patients in particular. And we'll outline some of the rationale today there. Uh, in all of our clinics, community, dialysis, peritoneal home, chronic kidney disease, we have an interdisciplinary approach. So we have a number of people working together, uh, physicians, nurses, social work, uh, dietitians, pharmacists. 
And these are different teams in each of these clinics. And so this is a wonderful uh, approach, and it really does, I think, benefit our patients, but it also makes it challenging to introduce changes and uh, to change the culture of care or, or change the uh, approach to care, and in this case, to incorporate the palliative approach. As far as our patients, generally, most are elderly. The average age is over 70 and appears to be climbing all the time, and many have multiple coexisting comorbidities. Um, they already have a high morbidity and mortality because of their chronic kidney disease, and that's well recognized. And then adding uh, further uh, uh, comorbidities on top of that only increases their, their risk overall. Our patients have a high symptom burden, uh, most studied in hemodialysis populations, but increasingly studied in other populations. And the chronic kidney disease group uh, appears to have similar uh, symptom burden to our, our already well recognized high symptom burden of the dialysis population. And what makes things challenging is the uncertain trajectory of their kidney function. We do know that they, many of our patients have progressive loss of function, but despite lots of efforts by, by uh, individuals all over the world at being able to elucidate a, a, a projection uh, theory or, or uh, equation, and none has really come to the fore. So it's very difficult to predict for an individual when they may reach a certain milestone as far as function. Uh, and when they may require dialysis or final decisions about that to be made. And it makes it challenging to plan uh, palliative approach preparations and end-of-life planning as well. Uh, to give a bit of a picture, what is well recognized, I think, in practitioners in nephrology, but maybe not so well recognized or so well shared with patients and families, is the high mortality that kidney disease brings. This is one example. Uh, the purple bars is the, as you recognize, higher mortality in patients on dialysis compared to the light gray bars at the bottom, similar patients who are not on dialysis, not have kidney failure. And even in their elder years, there's a significant separation of the higher mortality uh, in those patients who have kidney failure. The transplant population is in the middle, and transplant, we recognize, does provide a survival advantage uh, over and above dialysis, but not suitable for many patients, particularly elderly. What's even more dramatic is the survival of patients who are over 75 or elderly in whatever study you're looking at who do start dialysis. In this graph, the top bar is uh, patients who are 75 years or older but not on dialysis, 80 and older and not on dialysis, and then this nice, uh, unfortunately, very low dark bar are those patients over 75 who've initiated dialysis, and the mortality is quite high and considerably higher than younger patients who initiate dialysis quite understandably, but nonetheless dramatically. So quantity of life is, is, is a challenge for those patients. What about function or quality of life? And this is one of many studies. This particular study is looking at their functional status. Other studies with similar graphs have looked at quality of life. And this is the last year of life in patients who are elderly with end-stage kidney failure. So that would be a kidney function 15% or less, not managed with dialysis. And what this shows, and, and it's important, is that their quality of life, in this case their functional status, is maintained through the last year of life until very near the end. And so uh, if we were thinking about interventions for this population, we have to think about what that, how that impacts their quality of life and their functional status, particularly uh, uh, recognizing the previous slides and the, their mortality. To contrast this to other disease trajectories, uh, cancer is, can be quite similar, although it does depend which cancers and which patients. Uh, but more commonly, diseases like cardiac, respiratory, or other organ failure, where you get exacerbations and remissions, and an uh, inexorable kind of decline in quality of life or functionality until death. And then, of course, the very frail patients who have a waxing and waning uh, process leading to their, the end of their life. So end-stage kidney failure in and of itself doesn't necessarily bring progressive declines in kidney in function sta functional status, I should say, or quality of life until very near the end of of a patient's life. Uh, this is another single example among many and accumulating evidence that survival of elderly patients initiating dialysis is not necessarily prolonged compared to those who choose conservative care. And this is, a, again, just one example, but increasing evidence documents that in a certain number of our elderly patient population, uh, dialysis may not confer an increase in, in quantity of life and it certainly appears that quality of life may not be uh, uh, improved either. Another one of many examples here looking at quality of life, and the HD refers to those who have chosen hemodialysis, and again, this is an elderly group of patients. 
uh, peritoneal dialysis, and conservative management, or ND is no decision made before they died. So not having initiated dialysis, so they never committed to conservative management. And what this graph shows, and others have shown as well, is that quality of life does decline significantly in those older patients who chose to start hemodialysis, in those older patients who chose to start perineal dialysis, commonly thought of as a more gentle modality, uh, compared to those who chose conservative management or who didn't make a decision and died before a decision uh, was required. And so really, we've got a patient population that is common, uh, that seems to be increasing in number, and for whom we have difficulties in predicting uh, their projection, their, their functional uh, kidney function over time, and we're trying to make decisions with them and, and educate them along the way so they can make an educated decision. And questions often come up is, will it change the quantity or duration of someone's life? And I think what we can see from uh, the brief example and others as well is that it's not clear. It's certainly a large number of these patients, there will be no expected benefit and expected quantity of life. And in some studies, it's shown actually a decrease in their life expectancy by initiating dialysis, typically those with more comorbidities. Does it change their quality of life and their lifestyle? Well, it appears to fairly consistently. Unfortunately, it appears to impact it negatively. And in one study in the New England Journal of Medicine, almost half of patients who were older who started dialysis showed a significant and dramatic decline in the functionality in the first six months after starting dialysis. And this is borne out in anecdotal experience and in other studies as well. Low blood pressure, hypotension on dialysis is very common, and it's more common in the elderly. And they also seem to get other side effects or symptoms of dialysis more commonly than younger patients, as you may understand easily. Uh, fatigue is very common in the elderly, more common than in other populations. And fatigue is one of the most common symptoms on dialysis and is only exacerbated in someone who's already predisposed or already experiencing significant fatigue. We do promote uh, more independent dialysis, even simply getting someone closer to their home in a community dialysis unit. But our elderly population, and particularly those with more comorbidities, are often not suitable for certainly independent dialysis, where they would be performing much of the procedure themselves, or even for the community dialysis, where at least they could be close to home, just because of the, the fact that those, those patients tend to be uh, more stable by requirement because of the situation. Our community units are out of the hospital. Our home patients are doing a lot of the work themselves and engaged and involved in that, and it's not often feasible for our older population, especially with multiple comorbidities. And um, what we've seen and what's been documented is that dialysis can force a person from their home and their independence due to the increases in level of care required due to the decrease in their functional status. And sometimes this leads to uh, increase in care to the nursing home level. And so if we've got patients who have perhaps a stable functional status without dialysis, a non-necessarily expected increase in quantity of life with dialysis, we really do have to find a way to impart that information to patients and help them and their families make appropriate decisions so that we don't actually uh, you know, negatively impact their life by, by introducing dialysis where it may not be most appropriate. So that's all well and good from our perspective, but when we've, uh, patients have been approached about what they are looking for in renal care, um, these things seem maybe self-evident, but nonetheless, I think really important to keep in mind, and we try and keep these in mind as we're planning our approach uh, in the kidney care clinic. Um, they want proactive and empathetic listening, and they want healthcare providers to assess, discuss, and listen to their individualized concerns related to the illness. And what they really want is information about treatment options and disease progression, and I would say that includes the potential of morbidity and mortality issues you've been talking about. They look for a holistic approach to care, not simply the number, their function, and the assumed uh, consequences of that. And of course, they want good symptom management and something that we're also working on and we'll outline shortly uh, that's not necessarily been so systematically uh, attended to previously. So within our program, um, we've uh, tried to incorporate a palliative approach and this is really trying early on and throughout all of our patients, but certainly I think it's important that we try and focus it on those patients who are most likely to require a really intense, uh, a more intensive approach. And that identifies patients who are older, who have comorbidities, or who are otherwise uh, more susceptible to, to some of the difficulties we've mentioned already. Um, we have, as I've mentioned, an interdisciplinary and holistic approach to care already, and so we're just trying to incorporate the palliative approach generally within our already existing clinics. And we, uh, we try and maintain ongoing open patient-centered discussions about their healthcare needs, 
as they evolve. And we do tend to have patients for life. Patients who come to kidney clinics tend to stay with us for the rest of their lives, and we don't tend to have a lot of patients who we cure, fix, and leave us. So we have a long time and a long relationship with these patients and their families. Advanced care planning, I think, as everyone listening probably recognizes, is a keystone to the palliative approach. And again, not so systematically applied in our patient populations, and we're making efforts to try and improve that. And I know there are provincial and national efforts along those lines generally as well, and we're involved in some of those also. And of course, pain and symptom management, as mentioned, not always so systematically approached, and uh, I think uh, too much to our patient's detriment. And so we're hoping and, and trying to uh, move that forward as well and improve that aspect of their care overall. We've been fortunate in working with the palliative care program here at Vancouver General Hospital, and we're also fortunate that BC Renal Agency recognizes the importance of the palliative approach and end-of-life care, and uh, we've involved in different committees ourselves uh, developing, and, and we now are using tools and guidelines that BC Renal Agency has put together, and more, of course, are in the works and, and forthcoming. Uh, we're also taking advantage of the emphasis on advanced care planning nationally and provincially and locally, and uh, using various tools available there. We'll outline some of those shortly uh, to bring it to our program, both staff and patients and families. And we'll outline in more detail our symptom management initiative, which has begun a couple of years ago now in our hemodialysis unit and our plans to expand it across our, our various clinics. And importantly, we, we think it's uh, uh, important that a conservative pathway be developed so that our patients have a, a clear understanding of what uh, approach short of dialysis would really look like for them. Up till now, it's certainly something we've been doing on an ad hoc basis, but I think it's really important, and other, other programs have developed this uh, further along than we are currently, and I think it's made great uh, uh, improvements in their patient care for those significant number of patients for whom conservative care is most appropriate. Uh, working with the program, the palliative care program, we've had them come and give education uh, programs for our staff and we've been looking to improve communication between programs, and we've had um, uh, great success in uh, introducing the concepts of a palliative approach to care and palliative care and clarifying misconceptions, and uh, specifically uh, talking about advanced care planning and, pl and clarifying any misconceptions, misunderstandings, and improving the general understanding amongst our staff who work with our patients day to day about all of these issues. And we're continuing those efforts uh, as well uh, ongoing. As mentioned, the BC Renal Agency has end-of-life committees. There's an end-of-life framework that's been drafted and some other tools that we're using to help to incorporate this idea into our clinic specifically here. And within the BC Renal Agency's end-of-life framework, there are four pillars, uh, including, as mentioned in our perspective, patient identification, uh, those who are most likely to uh, be in the situation where we should be paying careful attention to all these issues, symptom assessment and management, and we'll detail a bit further what some of those uh, resources are within the BC Renal Association tools, um, care of the dying patient and bereavement afterwards, as well as, of course, the crux of things, advanced care planning. Within the BC Renal Agency tools, there are several algorithms already published. They're available online if anyone cares to look them over. Um, algorithms currently exist for insomnia, paritis, and restless leg syndrome which are all common, and others are in the works and, and, and just finalizing. Uh, these are all symptoms that are very common, can be very distressing to our patients, and for which there's often very little really good research done on how to approach it. So these are guidelines based on expert opinion, gathering what evidence there is, and trying to uh, standardize the approach in hopes of improving the symptom management across the, the sort of continuum of CKD. There are also pain management resources, as many know, with kidney failure, many drugs have to be adjusted, many approaches have to be changed, and pain is a very common symptom in our patients for a variety of reasons, and there are guidelines and tools online with the Renal Association to help manage pain in our patients, which we, we are incorporating into our approach here at Vancouver General Hospital. Um, the Renal Association has a, a database called PROMISE, and just very briefly, it's a repository of information about our patients who are referred and followed for chronic kidney disease. It houses their laboratory data, which is uploaded automatically from labs across the province. It also houses data including consultation notes and imaging and a whole bunch of other data we collect as part of their care in kidney disease clinic or in dialysis clinics around the province. And it's easily accessed by uh, nephrology care practitioners throughout the province as patients move about, for example, short-term or long-term. 
they developed an advanced care planning module, uh, which is a repository for discussion documentation, for the documentation of decisions, as well as for any specific legal documents that may exist. And we're hopeful that this will be shared eventually with other databases so that this kind of information can be uh, accessed at point of care for our patients wherever they may wind up. Um, other tools we use from the BC Renal Association include uh, tools aimed at modality education for our patients. Um, there's PowerPoint and Prezi presentations available which are used. They're interactive, patient-centered, and they really focus on helping the presenter uh, use style and strategies that will really engage patients and families to ensure the information that's required can be imparted to patients and their families and help them make informed decisions. And the goal, ideally, is to present all relevant modalities quite equally without any particular bias to give patients all the information they need to make those decisions. Okay, so we've started by talking to you a little bit about our program and by talking with you about working with our palliative care team and about some of the tools available to us. And I'm gonna keep going and just talk to you about some of the initiatives that we are still involved with, starting with advanced care planning. So this, um, this for us has meant focusing on staff education, both in our chronic kidney disease clinic and in our hemodialysis unit. This has meant um, kind of getting an understanding of the existing tools that we have at our disposal, uh, both provincially and within our health authority. This has meant looking at how we're doing with advanced care planning right now um, and how we want to keep going which has also meant in engaging our team in discussion about how we can make advanced care planning sustainable. So advanced care planning, as a lot of people probably know, uh, it's very widely talked about right now at a national level, a provincial level, and at a health authority level. And we have lots and lots of tools to refer to to help us with this. Um, so for us, this means the My Voice booklet. There's also the national Speak Up booklet, which kind of guides you in having conversations and figuring out what kind of things you want in your advanced care plan. Um, we've talked a little bit about the BC Renal Agency, so we have various committees through this that help us to learn a little bit more about this. And within our health authority, we have um, education pamphlets, we have uh, documents that we can chart in. We just have lots and lots of tools uh, to help us with advanced care planning. And yet, despite all of these initiatives and resources, we realized that advanced care planning was not really a part of our culture within the renal program. And we learned this through a chart audit, uh, which was back in August 2014 in our kidney clinic, which greatly identified the need for staff education about advanced care planning and led to our collaboration with the Vancouver General Hospital palliative care team. So um, in working with the palliative care clinical nurse, nurse specialist, as Dr. Duncan was saying, we started to focus on introducing, introducing a palliative approach to care, starting to talk about how this works within a renal care setting um, and, and how staff can start to have advanced care planning conversations with patients and their family members. So there was quite a lot of information that we provided, but more importantly, these education sessions focused on um, staff comfort with having these difficult conversations. And I think this was a major strength of these education sessions. So not just about you know talking about the pamphlets we have and how to hand them out to people, but really what are the barriers to having these tough conversations? And it was our goal that approaching our education this way would, would lead to better quality um, more normalized advanced care planning conversations, which would result in patient family members who are less distressed and more prepared, less likely to have regrets about the decisions they're making, and overall better mental health. So, again, we have all these tools at our disposal. We have stacks of pamphlets, we have My Voice booklets, we have websites, and all that good stuff. But rather than, than focus on, on all that, we really just wanted to encourage the staff to help patients start a conversation about their future healthcare goals, and um, as importantly, to share this information with the people in their lives that are going to be helping them and supporting them. In terms of progress on this, we did a post-education chart audit 
um, which showed improvement in, in several areas in terms of asking about advanced care plans and whether people have them in place in terms of introducing the concept, uh, in terms of discussing goals of treatment, discussing prognosis, and also discussing code status. So it, it, this is good progress, but we really do see it all as a work in progress. This is something that we continue to work on. And right now we are um, putting together some education sessions for the hemodialysis unit staff, again with the same emphasis of, of um, of course, providing the information, but more so focusing on what are the barriers to having these tough conversations. So now on to um, one of our symptom management initiatives. So as we discussed, this is definitely a, an important tenet of the palliative approach to care and also very important to renal care. There is a high symptom burden in people with end-stage renal disease. This has been historically under-recognized and um, more importantly, underreported. So oftentimes we, we see people when they come in for their dialysis runs and we're asking them how they're doing and, and people tell us that they're doing fine <laughs> without really much detail. And so um, we we're wanting to explore this a little bit further. Uh, our symptom management initiative uh, is taking place in our hemodialysis unit. So this is a unit that operates daily from 7 in the morning to 11 in the evening. We have about 50 staff, interdisciplinary. Uh, we have about 200 patients. The majority are older adults with multiple comorbidities, um, lots of complex symptoms, and of course they're coming in three times a week for about four hours at a time. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the tool that we used for our, that we're using for our symptom management initiative, um, but just wanted to preface it by saying, again, we're focusing on a broad goal of improving symptom care by reducing overall distress due to symptom burden in our patients. So there's a tool that we're using, um, but more importantly, we're kind of wanting to focus on this overall goal of improving symptom burden in a way that's sustainable for our team and in a way that's beneficial to our patients. So the tool that we are using, and this is called the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale, which has been modified. Um, this is a tool that has been used in cancer care, in palliative care, in cardiac care, um, and is also validated for use in the renal population. Um, you might or might not be able to see, there's a list of 11 symptoms, all common in end-stage renal disease, so pain, fatigue, drowsiness, nausea, um, appetite, shortness of breath, depression, anxiety, well-being, and then at the end there's also kind of a fill-in-the-blank area. So uh, this scale is distributed to people. They fill it, fill it out based on how they're feeling that day on a scale from 0 to 10. Um, this is something that is uh, distributed, we've distributed it at different times. Uh, at one point we were distributing it at about, uh, about four times a year and right now um, we're distributing it about twice a year. Um, and we are referring to the BC Renal Agency symptom management tools for helping kind of helping to manage our patient's symptoms. So from our patients, we have learned quite a bit from this exercise. Um, we've noticed that people are a lot more open about the symptoms that they're having. So rather than going around and asking somebody how they're doing and hearing that they're doing fine, we're seeing that people are a little bit more open and detailed when they're using the ESAS. Um, but we are also seeing that the, the there is a challenge in helping to support patients who have complex symptoms that can't necessarily be helped or that won't necessarily improve, and so helping to support those patients. Um, and then also living in a diverse city like Vancouver, uh, we are working with folks coming from all over the place speaking different languages. Um, the, and this, is, this can be addressed quite easily through interpreters and through translated tools, um, but it is something that we've noticed that kind of puts, puts a hitch in things sometimes. Um, and then also we're working with folks who have different uh, learning needs and different levels of cognitive capacity, so wanting their input, of course, and just kind of figuring out how to do that. So finally, another one of the initiatives that we're working on is um, 
a conservative care pathway in our program. Um, so essentially, this, this just means providing another choice for people who do not want dialysis and do not want transplant, um, focusing on protecting and maintaining remaining kidney function, um, again, focusing on symptom management, focusing on maintaining a good quality of life, and helping patients and their family members to make other arrangements for themselves just in terms of additional medical care or social supports. Um, so what we're thinking about right now is how to present this information to people, um, as well as developing a concrete con conservative care pathway. This means um, developing a concrete pathway and then also integrating it into our existing clinic, um, thinking about clearly defining goals of care for our patients, um, support for physical and psychosocial symptoms, and referring onward to other healthcare professionals. Um, so this has elements of, of advanced care planning and symptom management, and it fits very appropriately under the umbrella of a palliative approach to care. And of course, in everything we want to do, we kind of want to track how, how well we're doing and how it's benefiting our patients. Uh, the BC Renal Agency uh, has a working group that is developing a, a, a draft of a pathway. It's a checklist, and essentially this is a tool that can be used in the kidney clinic um, for teams who are rounding on individuals who are opting for conservative management. And it's a very small screenshot, um, so we don't really expect you to see a lot, but essentially it just outlines the different phases of chronic kidney disease and different tasks to consider during these different phases. So for example, revisiting the advanced care plan, revisiting goals of care, checking in regarding symptom management, ensuring that we're communicating with the primary care team, and so forth. So this is in draft form right now. It's currently being informally tested out um, by different kidney clinics just to see how it works. Again, we want to be using tools that work well for everybody and that are benefiting our patients, and um, so that's where that is right now. So again, when we're talking about um, developing a conservative care pathway, we want to think of it as a fourth modality. Um, we want the different kinds of dialysis, transplant, and conservative management to be presented equally to people. Um, so right now that just means um, developing a more concrete pathway, kind of getting our resources lined up, um, and finding a way to present this information to well, staff, and but also patients and their family members. So then just in terms of moving forward for us, um, we are continuing to focus on advanced care planning. So for us, that means ongoing education for staff, both in our kidney clinic and our hemodialysis unit, um, and then also in the future for our independent dialysis clinics. Continued development of conservative care pathway for our, our kidney clinic, and this means ongoing work with the BC Renal Agency working group for that pathway just to see how that's working. Um, and then we have also hired a conservative pathway nurse to, who's going to be working on developing um, a concrete pathway and, and helping our staff kind of figure out how to use that. So we are focusing ongoing, uh, ongoing evaluation of symptom management. Um, so ongoing use of the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. And for us right now that means focusing on the follow-up. How are we supporting these patients who have articulated the symptoms that they're having to us? Uh, ongoing promotion of a palliative approach to care within our program. And for us, that pretty much just means when we are um, having education sessions for our staff, when we're having meetings, when we're rounding on patients, um, just talking about how we can apply a, a palliative approach to care for our patients. And for all of the initiatives that, that we're involved in right now, we, we always are focusing on sustainability. Um, so we want to be using tools and um, processes that are, of course, helpful to our patients and their family members, but also fit well with um, what our staff are doing. Um, we don't want to really reinvent the wheel or make them do anything that's kind of unnecessarily um, time consuming and so engaging the staff in conversations about what they think is sustainable and getting their ideas as well. Um, so those are some of our references.
and we will answer any questions you have.